Last week on Monday, police and firefighters in Aberdeen, Washington, rescued an elderly woman who was trapped in her house. Uh, a mudslide from a, just a torrential downpour had knocked this house off of its foundation, and she and her dog were trapped inside. The, the firefighters cut a hole in the roof of the house and, and lowered uh, a fireman and a policeman down, and they pulled this elderly woman in her 80s and her dog up out of the house. And uh, they took her to the hospital. Thankfully, she's doing well. She's doing fine now. But also, uh, just a few miles away in the nearby town of Hoquiam, four other houses were either demolished or ruined from mudslides, knocking them clear off their foundations. There's a, a clip on, on YouTube showing one of these houses and the mudslide coming down, just <laughs> knocking it into the front yard. Can you imagine uh, your home being destroyed or, or damaged beyond repair? from some kind of disaster simply because the foundation was not strong enough to weather the storm. Everything in the house demolished, destroyed, and you have to start completely over. What would you do? You know, as devastating as that would be, it's even more heartbreaking and more common that people's lives are ruined because they're not built on a solid foundation. I want to talk about what it means to be a wise builder and to build on a solid foundation today. Today I'm starting a new series, a series based on the parables of Jesus, stories that changed the world, stories that Jesus told that, that changed people's lives. Jesus was a master teacher and a master storyteller. One of the reasons why he was so effective in his teaching ministry is because he knew how to penetrate not just the minds but the hearts of people by telling a story that they could relate to that would just capture their attention, their imagination, and, and be a story that uh, is close to their hearts, close to where they are. And he used that to change people's lives. I mentioned last week that we all have a story. Uh, our lives are an ongoing story. And God wants to use your story to make a difference in your world, in the lives of the people around you. And he wants to use your story for an eternal purpose, a point that will lead you to Christ and eternity, but also the people in your lives. So throughout this series, I, I want us to think about not just the story that Jesus tells, but also our own individual stories, the stories of our lives, and how God might be wanting us to share that story in a way that will make a difference in someone's lives, in someone's life. And, and one of the ways you can do that, I want to encourage you uh, to share your story with people in the church here. Uh, be a part of a life group. That's a time when we share together what's going on in our lives. And those stories of our lives make a difference. They're encouraging to others. And they give us all opportunities to reach out to each other and pray for each other and support each other. If you're not signed up for a life group, please uh, consider doing that. And uh, be ready to share your story. The parable I want to tell today and, and talk about today is the one in Luke 6, 46-49, the, the parable of the wise and foolish builders. Uh, Jesus tells this parable more than once. He also tells it at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7. But here in Luke 6, 46-49, Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I will show you what he is like who comes to me, hears my words, and puts them into practice. He is like a man building a house who dug down deep, laid the foundation on rock. When the flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like the man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. Jesus told this story at the end of his sermon. 
probably one of the greatest sermons ever preached. And this was his invitation. This is what he said in order to get his disciples to respond to the message. He wanted people to put his words into practice. He wanted people to take the teaching and make it real life. Jesus used word pictures often to uh, enhance his teaching and to illustrate the principles that he was presenting. And here he's using the word picture of architecture, a very common uh, metaphor in the Bible. We're, we're builders, as I mentioned earlier today, and God wants us to build on a solid foundation like the wise man. Um, we all have a structure um, that God is entrusting us to build and to, uh, to establish and to continue to develop. And it has to be built on a strong foundation if we want it to weather the storms of life. If we build on sand, like the foolish man, the storms of life will come and our house, our lives, our relationships will fall apart. Just like that house that was built on the sand. Jesus tells us exactly what it means to build on the rock. He's very clear when he explains the metaphor. Basically he's saying the people who follow his words and actually put them into practice, they're the ones who are building on a solid foundation. Those who are not, those who are not putting his words into practice, they're the ones who are going to suffer tremendous loss. Their lives will be falling apart. Their relationships will be falling apart. And ultimately, they'll lose their eternal salvation because they didn't build on the rock of Jesus Christ. The words of Jesus are words of life, words of abundant life, words of eternal life. The words of Jesus are powerful, life-changing words. The words of Jesus are, are for our eternal salvation. And when we build our lives on the words of Jesus, we're building on a solid foundation that will endure and remain stable even through the most difficult struggles and trials we encounter in this life. One of my uh, professors at seminary used to be a, a preacher, and when he first entered into the ministry, he was, he was young, he was inexperienced, he was struggling to figure out how to do things, and he had a, a ministry, a preaching ministry in Goldendale, Washington. And he was especially uh, struggling with evangelism and discipleship, getting people to come to Christ and, and really grow in their faith. But he became convicted when reading the Great Commission, reading what Jesus said about what it means to make disciples. Jesus uh, gave us the Great Commission to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And he became convicted that he needed to spend more time, more emphasis on the words of Jesus and helping people to follow what Jesus actually said. Now, there's a, a young girl in his church, a, a, a teenage um, cheerleader who would occasionally visit the church, but she didn't consider Christianity something that she needed to be a part of. She just liked to come to church for the social aspect of it. And she was fairly well, well off. She was very successful, straight-A student, very bright, always on the honor roll, uh, always on the cheerleading squad. So she didn't really see any need to change her life. She was content with what she had. And one day after church, she was talking to the preacher about her life and about her philosophy and what uh, she thought of Christianity. And, and he challenged her. He says, well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you do this for me? I, I just want you to read the Sermon on the Mount once a day. You're a bright young student you're a good reader. I've heard you read. Just, just read that once a day for two months. And as you read, think of something each day that you could apply to your life, that you could actually practice in real life from what you read in that passage. Are you willing to take that challenge? After two months, tell me if it made any difference in your life. Are you willing to accept that challenge? She said, yeah, I'll accept that challenge. And so she started reading the Sermon on the Mount each day for two months. Within one month, she had the Sermon on the Mount memorized, okay? And then at the end of two months, she came back to that preacher, and she said that God had 
changed her heart. Her attitude was completely different. That he had revealed uh, just incredible improvements in her life, in her relationships with others, in the development of character traits, in the development of a purpose beyond herself, instead of just living for her own accomplishments. And she knew that she needed to become a Christian. The words of Jesus, just reading them and putting them into practice, changed her life, her whole perspective on life. And she became a Christian because of it. The words of Jesus are the words of life. So how can we build a solid foundation for life? I, I see four things in this parable that Jesus tells us. Four things that can help us build a solid foundation for our lives. The first one is we need to acknowledge Jesus as the Lord. The first thing he says, he, he starts off with a question. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I want us to get the, get the point here. Acknowledging Jesus as Lord is not just something we do with our mouth. Jesus was actually rebuking his disciples, not for calling him Lord, but for calling him Lord and not living it out. Why do you call me Lord and do not do what I say? That's an inconsistency. You see, the word Lord is not just a title of respect. A lot of people say that Jesus is Lord. But that means something. And Jesus says, if you're going to use that title, it's got to be more than a title of respect. It's got to be a confession of how you live. The word Lord means master, owner, boss, the ruler, the one I've decided I'm going to follow and obey. If we say Jesus is my Lord, that's what we're saying. Jesus is my owner, my master, my boss, my ruler. I have decided to follow him and obey him. Now, let me make one thing clear. If we see an inconsistency between what we're saying and how we're living, Jesus is not telling us, stop calling him Lord. If there's anything we need to change, it's our actions. Okay? If you see an inconsistency in your life between what you say about Jesus and how you're living, we need to make sure we're bringing our actions in line with what we're saying when we say Jesus is Lord. That's what he's challenging his disciples to do. To acknowledge Jesus as Lord is something we do with our words and with our actions. However, the first step in building a solid foundation for life is to acknowledge Jesus as Lord in our hearts and to confess Jesus as Lord with our mouth. That's what Paul says in Romans 10, 9 through 10, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart, it is with the heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. This is the, the first step in coming to Christ, believing in our hearts and confessing with our mouths that Jesus really is the Lord. And then following up with that with actions that also acknowledge his lordship in our lives. This is a matter of salvation. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32 through 33, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. And remember, our actions speak louder than our words. Many times people disown Jesus with their actions even though they're confessing Jesus with their mouth. You think about Christians in other parts of the world, even today, who are being martyred, tortured, put to death for their faith. They're living out their Christianity, not just with words, but with actions. They're acknowledging Jesus as Lord. What would happen if that happened? If, if in, here in America, Christianity was illegal, punishable by death? What would happen if, if you were arrested under the charge of being a Christian? And they started to gather evidence from your life. They went on your Facebook and they examined all your conversations. And they checked different videos of you in public places with people. And they, they question your friends at school and at work, people in your neighborhood. 
and they gathered all this evidence and you were brought to trial on the charges of being a sincere follower of Christ, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Would there be enough evidence to convince a jury that, yeah, that person is a sincere follower of Christ? Or would you be off the hook? Is our life acknowledging Jesus as Lord? That's the beginning of a solid foundation. How do we build a solid foundation for life? Well, we need to acknowledge Jesus as Lord. We also need to come to Jesus. Initially, to become a Christian, but also continually, as Christians, continuing to come to Jesus. Uh, Jesus, in, in Luke 6, 47, says, I will show you what he is like. Who comes to me, hears my words, and puts them into practice. And he mentions three more steps here, in addition to acknowledging him as Lord. Three more steps that we need to take part in, that we need to, uh, to be involved in on a regular basis if we want to have a solid foundation. And the, they're all important, but the first one here is actually coming to Jesus. Coming to Jesus is absolutely essential for a solid foundation. And Jesus invites us to come to him. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See, coming to Jesus is, is recognizing that we need a Savior. It requires some humility on our part. We can't proudly come to Jesus as if we're doing him a favor. Okay? We need to come to Jesus desperately recognizing we have sins that need to be forgiven. And we want to live for all eternity in heaven, and we need God's grace and mercy in order to have a relationship with him. We can't fix ourselves. We are broken, imperfect, sinful people who need a savior. And it's only by the grace of God through Jesus Christ that we can be fixed, that we can have eternal life. Coming to Jesus is laying that cornerstone for a solid foundation for this life and the life to come. Peter uses this illustration in 1 Peter 2.4. He says, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. Jesus is pictured as that chief cornerstone, that stone that sets the foundation and determines how straight and how true the, the rest of the house is going to be. And when we build our lives, we need to start with the cornerstone of Jesus Christ and come to him and recognize, hey, I can't build my life by myself. My life's going to fall apart on my own. I need Jesus as that chief cornerstone. Coming to Jesus is a very simple process. We come to Jesus by, by putting our faith in Christ, acknowledging him as Lord in our hearts and with our mouths and turning away from our own way, our own sinful, selfish desires. That's called repentance. And being baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us and helps us to continue to build our lives on Christ. Have you made that first step? Have you laid that foundation stone? Have you come to Jesus? How do we build a solid foundation for life? Well, we need to hear the words of Jesus. He said in, in verse 47, I'll show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words. Yes, of course, we need to practice what Jesus says. We need to follow him. But how can we follow the words of Jesus if we never hear him? How can we do what he says if we never actually sit down and read what he says and listen to what he's saying to us? We have to stay in tune with his words and be constantly exposed to the words of Jesus in our lives. Think about all the different voices, all the different messages we hear in a typical day. Maybe your alarm clock wakes you up with uh, the radio program of some talk show or some music. Think about the, the messages that you're hearing. Maybe you listen to the radio on the way to work, on the, on the way to school. Are those messages, the messages of those songs in that talk show host, are they even remotely close to what Jesus is saying? And then when we get to, to work and we hear all these different things from our supervisors, our co-workers, the people that we're, we're serving in, in whatever kind of work that we're doing, or when we're at school and we, we hear the teachers and our, our fellow classmates, administrators, we're, we're getting tons of messages 
from all these different directions, are they in harmony with the words of Jesus? And then, and then when we get home, what do we do? What messages do we hear? What messages do we see? Most people spend hours in front of an electronic screen, either on their own personal device, their tablet, their phone, or their computer screen, or the TV. We spend hours looking at screens, seeing all kinds of different messages from, from shows on Netflix to video games to surfing the web to what we see on Facebook, what we text back and forth to our friends, all these different messages just surrounding us, piling in on our lives. Now, compare all those different messages of the world, the time we spend exposed to all those different messages to the, t the time spent hearing or seeing the messages of Jesus, the words of Jesus. How does it compare in a typical day? How much time in a typical day do you spend hearing the message of Jesus? How on earth can our faith be stable and strong? How on earth can we have a solid spiritual foundation if, if we're just bombarded with all the messages of the world and we don't give any time to Jesus? We need to hear the words of Jesus. Do you want a stronger faith? Here's what Paul says in Romans 10, 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. I want to challenge you to spend time every day this week listening to the words of Jesus. Whether it's on an audio file or or just out of a hard copy of an actual Bible with pages, you know. We can do that too. Or on your, uh, your smartphone, a, a Bible app. Spend time each day reading or listening to the words of Jesus. Sometimes we have selective hearing. Uh, we listen to the words of Jesus that we want to hear and avoid the words that we don't want to hear. Sometimes people go to church because uh, it's a church that makes them feel comfortable. And they avoid church if it's a church that makes them feel uncomfortable. Paul warned Timothy about this in 2 Timothy 4. He said, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers who will say what their itching ears want to hear. Brothers and sisters, that time has come. More and more preachers are avoiding passages of Scripture that make people feel uncomfortable and only talking about those subjects that make people feel good. More and more churches are staying away from the hot topics the, those topics that, that people don't like to hear. Many people are looking for spiritual leaders and teachers who will endorse their sinful lifestyles or at least not talk about them from the pulpit. You know, there are many things in the Bible that make me feel uncomfortable. Matter of fact, every time I read the words of Jesus, it's just a few minutes before he starts stepping on my toes. And I'm tempted to look at a different passage. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the words of Christ, all the words of Christ, not just some of them. If we want to build a solid foundation, we need to take time to listen to Jesus and listen to everything he's telling to us, everything he's saying to us. We can't have selective hearing when we listen to Jesus. How do we build a solid foundation for life? Well, we need to practice the words of Jesus. He says, I will show you what he is like who comes to me, hears my words, and puts them into practice. That is the wise man who's building on a solid foundation. Later on in verse 49, the difference he shows between the wise and foolish builder is that the foolish one, he comes to Jesus, he hears Jesus, but he doesn't put the words into practice. See, it's not enough to know what the Bible says. We have to put it into practice in our lives. The Bible is the word of God. It is powerful. Uh, Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God is powerful, but it's only living and active if we live it out in our actions. That's what makes 
the Word of God living and active. If people can see it lived out and acted out in our lives. Jesus described the Word of God as a seed that's planted in our hearts and it grows depending on the soil of the heart. And the way we allow that seed to germinate, grow, take root, and develop in our hearts is to live it out in our lives. You know, I love to study the Word of God. I get excited when I learn things about God. But I have to be careful because I know that Bible knowledge is a means to an end, not the end itself. The purpose of Bible study is not so that we can win when we're on jeopardy and the Bible category comes up. Okay? It's probably not going to happen to most of us anyway. But the purpose of Bible study is a transformed life. So every time we open up the scriptures, we need to start with a prayer and say, God, like uh, Psalm 119, open my eyes to see wonderful things in your law. And God, help me to see what you want me to change. Is, is there an attitude I need to change? Is there a character trait you want me to develop? Is there a sinful behavior you want me to stop? Is there a person in my life you want me to love more? Show me from this passage what you want me to change in my life. The Word of God is designed to be a mirror to help us evaluate our lives. And we look at the mirror of God's Word not by reflecting it on others. Oh, yeah, there's, uh, there's Josh over there. I can see he needs to change this and this. You know, <laughs> We look at a mirror when we get up in the morning to see what we need to change. And that, that's what James says in, in James 1.22. He says, do not, be, uh, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Later on, he says, the person who's, who's just reading the word of God and not doing anything about it is like a person who looks in the mirror and doesn't change anything wrong with his appearance. He just goes away and forgets what he looks like. God gave us his word so that we can make changes in our lives that establish a solid foundation, make improvements, help us to develop character, draw us closer to God, and bring us to eternal life. And of course, he helps us with that through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We're not on our own. This is a team project. The word of God is powerful. The words of Jesus really are words of life. Think about this this week. What, what, what will you do this week to put the words of Jesus into practice in your life? I'd like to have the praise team come at this time and prepare to lead us in a closing song. As they do that, think about building a solid foundation in your life. What's, what's the foundation of your life look like right now? If your life was a building project, uh, starting from scratch, where are you at in the building of this life, of this structure? And what kind of foundation do you have? Have you acknowledged Jesus as Lord? Have you come to him and been baptized into Christ? Are you hearing, listening to the words of Jesus, all of them, and are you putting them into practice? We're going to have a word of prayer and sing one more song. And after that, we're going to have a very short congregational meeting where we will uh, vote on the budget and uh, uh, Elder James Weldon will lead us in that. Let's be standing for a word of prayer at this time. Righteous Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you have given us an opportunity to build on a solid foundation the words of Jesus Christ and not just knowing them but living them out in a way that makes a difference in our lives. God, we thank you for this story, this parable and how it, it penetrates our hearts. It's something that we can relate to and we, we know about. And God, I just pray you'd help us to uh, um, really take it to heart and build that solid foundation by acknowledging Jesus as Lord and, and coming to you uh, continually and by listening to your words and putting them into practice. God, I also pray for everyone here and for uh, the story of their lives, God, that you give them opportunities to share their story in a way that makes a difference in people's lives and draws them closer to you. May you be glorified in all that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen.